All right, so our next topic is input files. This is covering how to get uh, data from a file into your program. I'll give you a word of warning. It is a little bit trickier than actually putting data from your program into a file. You start running into some of the runtime errors that I hinted at a little bit when I covered Appendix C. So let's get into that. Uh, from the focus section of the textbook, I will be covering 9.3. Uh, which is just about input files. But then from the apply section, I'll also briefly discuss 9.4 and 9.5, which are a couple of ways that we can use input files. Uh, you know, we can use the data contained in input files and you know solve some interesting problems with them. So let's get into it. Now the steps to input data are a little bit trickier than the steps to output data. The first thing you want to do is you declare the stream reader variable. That is pretty similar, but note that we're using a stream reader and not a stream writer. There's a difference between the two. A stream reader is able to take a file and read data from it. A stream writer is able to uh, you know, create a file or open up a file and um, write data to that file. It's a completely different functionality which is why we have to use completely different classes in order to make that work. But you declare the stream reader variable. The second thing you do, and you do this before you even try to open the file that you want to read, you first have to check to see if the input file exists. And the reason why is because if you try to open up a file that doesn't exist, you run into an error. So if it does exist, you know, we can actually work with it, all that kind of stuff. If it does not exist, then you warn the user. You give them a message box and you say, hey, I can't do that. And then you just uh, get out of the function, uh, get out of the um, procedure entirely. You don't even try to do anything with that file or anything with output or anything like that. You know, anything that relies on data from the file, you just warn the user and get out of there. You could use exit sub, you could just put everything inside of a massive if statement, uh, maybe with some independent procedures or, you know, functions or independent subs that you want to use to make things look a little cleaner. But, you know, whatever method you want to use, if the file does not exist, the only thing you should do is warn the user and maybe do whatever cleaning up you might need to, but you probably shouldn't need to do any cleaning up if the file doesn't exist because you know, what's the point of like actually doing any work if the file doesn't exist anyway? You just, you declare the variable and then you check for the file right away. If the file does exist, then you can do whatever your procedure is supposed to do. What your procedure should do, if the file exists, is you open the file for input, you read from the file, and then do whatever processing that you have to do as you're reading from the file, and then you close the file. Uh, so, that's the procedure. You declare the variable. If you check to see if the uh, file exists, if it does exist, you open it, you read from it, and then you close it. And you close it right away. So declaring the variable is pretty much the same as the stream writer, except for using the stream reader class like this. But the stream reader uh, is designed to read uh, data from a file sequentially rather than write data to a file sequentially and you have, you can think of stream reader as holding a queue of data for the program to read and process you have sort of a maybe a line at the you know the meat counter at the grocery store or a line at the bank or something like that um where each individual byte in the file each individual letter in terms of a text file right each letter has its position in the queue. It has its number that it's waiting for it to get called up. And then the stream reader is able to, you know, it holds all of those letters in a queue. And then it's able to process some of those letters, uh, you know, take them out of the line, process them, and then get them out of the building once they are done being processed. And then everyone else in the line, all the remaining letters kind of move up to the beginning of the line 
and then wait for their turn to be called. That's kind of the idea of what a stream reader is doing. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We'll talk more about that in the reading part of this. But yeah, an example of how you could use a stream reader variable or declare a stream reader variable is you say dim in file as io.streamreader. Just like that. It's very simple. The next step is to determine whether a file exists which is important because you can't open a file that doesn't exist. You get a runtime error because what you're asking Visual Basic to do is open up. If you, if you ask it to open up a file that doesn't exist, best case scenario, it recognizes, Hey, I can't find anything by that name. So I'm not even going to try. Worst case scenario is it naively tries to find something with that file name and it doesn't find something, but it accidentally opens up some garbage data that might actually hold, I don't know, uh, the, the, the classified secrets that your computer is trying to hide from you or something. And then all of a sudden you have access to that. And that sounds like a nightmare. And imagine if a, uh, imagine if a hacker did that to you. So that'd be really bad. So the computer isn't going to try to open up files that don't actually exist, you know, access data that isn't actually correlated with the, um, file name that you're trying to say exists. All of that would be really bad. So we don't, you know, Visual Basic doesn't want to do that, so it just gives you a runtime error. It says, hey, this file doesn't exist, so I'm going to stop working now, and then the program crashes entirely, which is bad. You don't want to do that. So the way that you can determine whether a file exists is using the io.file.exists method, and you pass in the file name that you would really like to work with, but you're not sure if it actually exists just yet. And you should always, always do this. Use this method, even if you are 200% sure the file exists. Because maybe it does on your computer, but maybe it doesn't elsewhere. And, you know, if you give the application to me and something goes wrong, maybe I don't see that text file that you have. And then your program breaks and then I have to take points off because of that. That would be really bad. So you always want to determine whether or not the file exists before you try to run it. Now, one way you can use this method. So th this method actually returns a Boolean value. It's true. If the file that has the file name you pass in does exist and it's false if it doesn't exist. So you can use it in an if statement like this, if, uh, io.file.exists employee.txt then and then you do all of the processing of the file employee.txt underneath it. So that is what you always want to do when you're trying to do file IO like this. Now opening files for reading is a lot simpler than opening files for writing. Uh, all you have to do is use the open text method of io.file. Um, so you uh, type in in file equals io.file.opentext, passing in the file name that you actually want to open. Of course, you only do this if you know for sure that the file exists. So inside of an if statement or inside of a procedure that is called from within an if statement. But um, yeah. Assuming that you know the file exists, using the exists method, you can use io.file.opentext, pass in the file name. This method will create a um, stream reader object that, you, that uh, then gets stored inside of your in file variable and that you can then use to start reading. All right, so the next step is to read from your files. Um, you only do this if the file exists. So if you try to read from a file that does not exist, that also is bad, especially, you know, if it's a file that's not open as well, you want to only read after the file is open and you should only open after the file has been confirmed to exist. But I mentioned before that a stream reader kind of has a queue of data where uh, individual characters can be processed and then taken out of the queue after processing, right? That's kind of what happens here is that data is consumed as you read it. So you read a certain amount of data, you remove it from the queue and then take care of all that data, whatever you're doing with it, whatever calculations. And then 
you have the rest of the data has moved up to the front of the queue again. Just like how it works at the DMV or something like that. So you read a certain amount of data. Uh, that data is removed from the queue. The unread data is left behind in the queue, but now it's been moved forward now that there's empty space at the beginning, beginning of the queue. That's the um, idea that I want to go with going forward with this um, with uh, reading from files. So there are two methods of reading. Uh, you can read the entire file at once, or you can read line by line. Reading the entire file is super easy because you use the read to end method. Um, the read to end method of a string reader variable returns a string that contains all of the data left in the queue. Uh, so if you have never used any, like the other read method yet, if you, if this is your first time reading anything from the file, it gives you the entirety of the file as one string, uh, consuming the entirety of the queue in doing so. Um, so then your one string has all of these like line breaks and all that kind of stuff. It has all of the uh, characters as is, as you see them when you open up that file in a text editor. One example of using that method is the uh, line right here. I can set um, text reports uh, text property equal to in file dot read to end. And that puts all the contents of read to end inside of the text property right here, which works fine if you don't have any sort of formatting or calculating line by line that you need to do. If you just need to display everything in a file, for example, that's a fine way of doing that. Now, reading line by line is a little bit more complicated. Um, Essentially what you do is you use a loop uh, and while the file is not empty or until the file is empty, you keep on reading and processing your lines. Now the first method, and there's two methods that we have to use here, but the first one is called peak, which essentially returns but does not consume the next character in the queue. So it just takes a look at the next character in the queue and says, hey, there's this character in the queue right here. This is the one you're looking. This is the one that you're going to see next. Uh, but it doesn't consume it. It leaves that character as is. The uh, really really helpful thing we can use the peak method for is its other return value. It returns negative one if the queue is completely empty, which means that the file has been completely processed. Which means that we can use our peak method as a while or until condition in order to uh, in order to tell us when we are no longer able to look at another line. Or we can also use it to tell us if there is another line to look at. Um, because, you know, if we try to read a line but the queue is empty, that's going to give us an error. So we only want to read lines when we know that there is a character left in the queue, at least one character left in the queue. So we use the peak method to show us whether or not there is a character left in the queue. So once we know that there is a um, character in the queue using peak, then we can use read line, which will give us a string starting at the beginning of the queue and ending at the next new line, but it doesn't actually include the next new line. It just uh, takes everything up until the the first new line that it sees, returns that to us, and then it just removes the new line from the queue entirely. So then the next character is uh, not that first next, not that first new line, but the next character that there was entirely. Um, so if, uh, yeah, it, it just returns you the next line of text from the file, everything from the beginning to the next new line. If there are no more, no more new lines, it will just return everything from the beginning of the queue to the end of the file. But all of the data that it has returned to you is consumed. It re it's removed from the queue as well as the new line that is there. Uh, and everything after that new line is moved up to the front. 
So it just lets you read one line at a time. So you combine these two using a loop. While there's a character left in the left in the, the uh, file, you read the line, you do something with the line, and then you uh, go back up to the top and check to, to see if there is another thing. So this is an example of how you would read line by line. Um, you use uh, a do until in file.peak equals negative one, or do while it doesn't equal negative one, but you use in file.peak, compare it to negative one. As soon as in file.peak equals negative one, you break out of the loop. But the first thing you put inside of this do loop is the call to read line. You don't call read line before the do until loop because there is such a thing as an empty file. And you don't want to work with empty files. Uh, or, sorry, you don't want to read from empty files because then you'll get an error as well. So you always want to first check to see if peak gives negative one. And if it does not give negative one, then you read the line and you store it in whatever string your you know, variable you're working with or whatever property you're working with and then do whatever other processing you're doing. But that is how this whole thing works is you check to see if there's a next, the next line using a loop condition. Uh, and then the first thing you do inside of the loop condition is update your variable containing uh, whatever line you're looking at to hold that next line. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to check to see if uh, in file.peak is negative one using an if statement up here and get like an initial value for string line and then have a while loop or anything like you don't need to worry about all that kind of stuff all you need is this loop right here just set it up like this do all of your calculations inside and that that's all you need it, it's that simple uh also do not use a post test loop because a post test loop assumes that there is a line in the text file but there may not be a line in the text file because you could have an empty file so a post-test loop would run into an empty file and it would break completely. You don't want to do that at all. Just do a pre-test loop where it runs while uh, infile.peak is not equal to negative one or until infile.peak is negative one. That's all you have to do. It's just a very simple setup. And of course, you do this after you have verified that infile exists and then you open infile and all that kind of stuff. All right, and then finally we have closing files. So remember, you should only open your files if the file actually exists, which means that you should only close your files if the file exists as well, because you shouldn't close a file that isn't open, otherwise you run into some trouble. Um, but you just call the close method. So you have your infile.close right here. But you always close your files when you're not using them. So you um you want to close your file as soon as you are no longer working with it so as soon as your while loop finishes um then you would want to close it right away and then just finish up the rest of the cleanup and the, you know, the final calculations and all that kind of stuff but you want to close it as soon as possible in terms of you know the uh, program actually having you know, running and having the file open and all that kind of stuff. All right, so we have this game show program again. Um, what this uh, also has as a functionality is a read from file button that it can press and it loads all of these contestants up into our uh, output right here. So what it's actually doing is it's reading from that same contestants.txt file that I showed before uh, and loading everything in just like this. Here's the code for this. It's very simple um, for this particular problem. All we do is we declare our infile variable as a string reader. We check if contestants.txt exists and then open up the file for input. Um, if, uh, if it does exist, of course we open it for input. We uh, use the open text method that we showed before, set that equal to infile, infile 
uh, receives the stream reader uh, that is returned from the open text method. And then this one is super simple. It's just a matter of uh, taking the text box with um, the certain properties that actually the um, text the textbook can go more into detail about you know which properties are being set in order to make the output look the way it does but it just reads everything that's in the file and puts it straight into the text box as is uh scrolling is handled well and because of the way that the um because of the way that everything is formatted when we have our output right here uh it writes every single name as a new line. So we're guaranteed that every name will be its own line. So then when we actually read our uh, contestants.txt file back into the program, we can assume that every contestant is on its right line. So when you're, if you're uh, outputting data and then also inputting the same data that you might output, you really wanna make sure that there's that synergy between what is being output and what you're reading in when it's being input. You want to either, you know, set those standards for yourself so that you know for sure your output will look a certain way and that your input functions can expect your output to look a certain way. Or, you know, you follow exactly along with the instructions uh, in the exercise so that your input will, you know, expect the output to look as you would expect. This is really important, by the way, because I will use test files to test your functions that take in file input. And if your functions don't work with my files, you will lose points because they, um, you know, it doesn't go along with the instructions for the exercise. If the exercise do in fact specify a particular input and output format, if they don't, then I will follow along with what your program is doing, of course. But if they do, uh, if they do specify something, then I will be testing using that specification, just as that heads up. But yeah, that's what's happening. Um, because the output like that assume you know actually stores every name on its own line. The input is also assuming that every name is on its own line, so it just uses read to end to take this already nicely formatted file turn that into a nicely formatted string and stick that into the text property right here. And then it closes immediately. And of course we have this cannot find the file message box right here. I actually already showed it working just fine. So uh, let me just change this to blah.txt, which doesn't actually exist. Uh, and then run the program. So we can see what the message box looks like. And we'll see this cannot find the file uh, message box which is what happens when um, you can't actually find the file that you're trying to open. So now what I want to do is show off a little bit of input and output. So the first thing I'll do is I'll read from the file um, and then I will type in my own name, Iris Puller, and write that to the file. And you know, the text box actually gets cleared completely. I'll also put Marley um, Silly Mouth. That's her legal name. I saw it on her birth certificate yesterday. Um, write that to the file as well. And then I'll read. All these contestants right here are exactly the same, except now we have my name and Marley's name, just like that. So that is uh, an example of reading and then writing and then reading again and seeing that updated value as we read. But yeah, uh, as we write to the file right here, um, the text is actually emptied by the write to file uh, procedure because, you know, I've written to the file, which means that now this text box has out of date information. I could try to put this stuff inside of the text box myself. But then it gets a little bit tricky because, you know, I'm assuming that the file has actually been correctly written to based, uh, and then I put the, um, you know, 
the name that I just added at the end of the text box and all that kind of stuff. But then the text box isn't actually reflecting the the contents of the file. It's reflecting the old contents of the file plus whatever I just added. If there was a mistake, for example, if I um, accidentally used create mode instead of append mode, I wouldn't know that until it's too late because my program would make it look like everything is working correctly, even though it's not actually working correctly. So you have to be real careful with that. I, I would recommend um, doing what the textbook does here and clearing out the text box rather than actually uh, making it, you know, putting that in that uh, input directly into the text box and then hoping that the change was actually successfully made to the file. All right, now I want to show off what happens if you forget to close um, either, and, and this works for, uh, for if you forget to close a stream reader or a stream writer, but I'm going to forget to close a stream writer right here. So I'll run the program. Uh, when I read from file, the file is no longer closed. So what happens is the file is still considered open by Visual Basic, even though uh, button read underscore click is still, um, you know, theoretically it's finished because it has uh, read to the end of everything, but then the file hasn't actually closed. It's still stuck being open. Now, if I type in, let's see, I'll just type in blah, blah, just like that. And I'll try writing to the file and we get an unhandled exception. The process cannot access my uh, contestants.txt file because it is being used by another process. What's happening here is that if I forget to close um, right here, then that file stays open. The uh, reader is still trying to read, you know, it's still holding onto that file because it thinks I'm still trying to do something with the file. Even though I've read to the end, it still thinks I'm trying to do something with the file, so it holds onto it until I specifically say to close it, which means that when I then click the right button and then try to open that file for, you know, appending, well, the file is already open for reading and it can't be opened again for appending because what happens if I modify a file that is currently being read? Bad things. So Visual Basic doesn't allow that. When you open a file as either um, for reading or for writing, Visual Basic kind of puts a lock onto it which prevents that file from being opened by anything else. I wouldn't even be able to open it uh, using Notepad if I forgot to close it out like that. So yeah, you run into errors like that. So you always have to close your files. It's really important. All right, so here is another example. We have a program that is uh, taking in a text file that holds uh, sales for a particular company. Uh, but this text file holds those sales in a very particular manner. Um, what it does is it groups together the item that is being sold and then the amount of sales we have made for that type of item. So beverages, we have sold $340,500. For food, we have sold $540,200 and so on and so forth. All of these values have a category name followed by a value, a numerical value like this. Now, suppose we're trying to actually, uh, you know, suppose we're trying to actually get the total accumulated value of all of our sales. Um, that means that we'll have to go into this file and try to figure out ways in which we can handle having uh, these, this mixture of non-numeric strings and numeric strings, just like this. So let's get into how we might do that. All right, so here is the idea. Um, we are taking a uh, sales.txt text file, which is actually what I just showed you right here. Uh, and we're checking to make sure it exists which is great. Um, also, we have our stream reader up here. So we declared the variable, we checked to see if it exists, uh, and we have our message box in case the file doesn't actually exist. But if it does exist, then we actually open up the file 
uh, using open text and we set that equal to our stream reader. Now, inside of our loop, we're actually going to go line by line. And what we're going to do here is actually pretty clever. Um, so sales.txt right here, we have one line, which is the product category, and then one line, which is the amount uh, that that category made in sales. So we always have one line of text and one line of numerical text. So product category, numerical text, product category, numeric text, product category, numeric text, and so on and so forth. We don't care about the product categories. We can just completely get rid of those altogether. All we care about is the um, actual numeric categories like this. But the other thing that's really interesting about this particular format, if we make sure to be very careful about how we set up our input file like this, you're never going to have a product category that doesn't have an associated value. Every product category will be guaranteed to have an associated value if we set up our input uh, file like this in this sort of record format where we have uh, the category and then the value and then the category and then the value one after the other just like that. As long as we um, stick to this format then we are totally fine to do what I'm about to propose. If we always have a text, a non-numeric product category, maybe not even a non-numeric category, just a product category directly and always followed by a numeric value, what we could do is read the first line and then completely throw out that first line because we don't care about the product categories. We're just trying to accumulate the value. So we read the first line, throw it out. The next line will be a number based on how we set up our file. So we parse that number and then add it to our accumulator. And then we uh, reach the end of our loop. At the beginning of the next iteration of the loop, we read the product category, throw that out completely, read in the number, parse it, add it to our accumulator. We uh, reach the end of the iteration and go back up. So that is what's happening right here. We read the category first, which will just be some text, um, they're just saving it as a string right here. We wouldn't even need to do that. If we weren't using the category whatsoever, uh, we could just get rid of it like this. Throw it out completely. But I'll just leave it like that for now. And then we read the sales amount and convert it to an integer, which we are certain that we can do because of how we formatted the uh, sales text file. And probably this would have some attached documentation that would tell users how to properly format the sales uh, text files in order to work with this application. Or there might be some program that converts uh, a more commonly used form into this format before running this application or something like that. But regardless, there would be some way of ensuring that the input file is correct. But assuming that it is, which we will, uh, we will convert the, the next line that we read, which we are certain by construction is an integer. Uh, we'll, or sorry, is a number. We'll convert that to an integer and stick it into our int sales variable right here. And then we add that to our accumulator and then continue on to the next iteration. So we're re we are reading two lines at a time inside of our do until loop like this, but we're able to do that even though we're only checking every other line to see if that line exists. We're able to take the chance on the second line that we read in because of how certain we are that the sales.txt file is formatted properly. This is fine to do if you're using like an internal uh, document that either you're creating or it's following some company standard or something like that. If the user is creating these documents themselves, you might want to be a little careful about that. You might want to check them and say, you know, hey, make sure that you're, um, make sure that you are uh, using this properly or, you know, check every single line to make sure it exists. And then if it, you know, this next line right here doesn't exist, then throw an error or something like that, whatever. But 
in the case right here where we have created sales.txt in this example and we know that sales.txt will be formatted correctly, this is safe to do. And then of course uh, we close in file directly after the loop, which is good practice to do when you're using a loop in order to read through a file. And by the way, this is what the application looks like in, uh, you know, when you actually run it, you click calculate, you get this value right here. So now what if you had a comma separating the category name from the actual price amount, rather than having a new line separating the comma from, or the uh, category name from the price amount. Uh, what we would have here is a CSV fi uh, file, a comma separated values file, where we have the first column right here. This actually forms a table. So the first column is the category name and the second column is the actual price. And what we would need to do is actually figure out how to split off the category name from the price. So let's figure out how to do that. So now because the category and the price are on the same line, we actually have to treat this a little bit differently. And this is where our string operations can come in handy. So what I can do is I'll create a new string variable. So dim uh, string line uh, as string, just like this. Um, and then the category is going to be everything in the line before uh, the actual comma. Because like what I have right here, everything before the comma, and then everything after the comma is going to be the price. And also I have to make sure to get rid of this little uh, space right here. So let's take a look at how to do that. Um, the first thing I want to do, rather than having string category be in file.readline, I'm actually going to have string line be in file.readline. And then what we'll want to do is set a uh, string category equal to everything before the comma. So if you remember our trick that we used before, um, let's see, string category equals string line dot, uh, should be sub string. Um, the start index is going to be zero and the length is going to be uh, string line dot index of the comma character. Oh. Uh, that should actually be the comma string, my bad. But that should give us the category just like that. And then I'll actually put a dot trim at the end just to really make sure things are clean right here. But then, um, for a try parse, instead of reading a new line, well, everything is already on the line that we've read. So instead, I'm going to use string line. Um, I'm going to invoke the remove method. Uh, I can start at the index of the comma plus one. So I want to start at whatever character is after the comma right here. So string line dot index of passing in the comma like that, uh, plus one. So then let's see, in this case, um, that would start at the space right here, which we don't necessarily want to start it at the space, except I'm going to trim it anyway. The nice thing about using the trim up here and the trim down here is that I can have any combination of spaces around the comma like both sides separated by a space or no sides separated by a space or whatever. Um, and it should still work just fine. Uh, but this should successfully work as an integer, you know, convert that to an integer, get the number out of this line in the CSV file. So, all right, and I made a couple of very silly mistakes. Um, first off, I need to use the starting index as zero, and then the length would be a uh, index of the comma plus one in order to actually fully get the comma. Not the uh, the starting index is the start of what gets removed, not the start of what gets kept. I briefly confused remove a substring, so that's my bad. Uh, the other thing was that I had to. Um, 
uh, changed sales.txt to sales.csv, and that gave me a couple errors that I wasn't expecting off camera. But here we go. I can calculate it now, and we get the proper result. So that is how you could work with a CSV file like this. You actually have to use things like index of and substring and remove and all that kind of stuff in order to get um, the get the proper uh, values into the proper places for both the category and the um, sales amount there. All right, and now the last thing I want to show you is a quick and dirty way of sorting data that is contained within files. Um, if we have a file that just has a whole bunch of entries, one entry per line, sort of like what we have here, um, then we can actually quite easily sort this using Visual Basic, a uh, quick and dirty trick that I can show off. So yeah, this file contains all of the states in the United States of America, and we're going to show off how to sort everything very easily. All right, so all we have here is a very simple application that has a list box containing state names uh, and a button to write everything in the list box to file. But not much else. Well, what's going on here is that when you load the application under the me.load event, um, this application actually uh, reads in every single state at, uh, into an item in the list box. And the reason why we have to use uh, peak and read line like this is because we're adding each line individually into the list box. We don't have a great way of doing that using um, you know, the, the other read function, the one that reads to the end of the file. So we have to do this line by line. But line by line, we are adding every single item into the file using this while loop right here. But that is pretty standard. So we, we open the application like this, and it just reads all of the state names into the list box in order, in the same order that they were actually typed up here. You can verify that on your own after completing the exercise. But Really, uh, the only other thing that's going on is this write to file button, which just for every uh, for everything in the list of items, uh, starting at index zero and going to the count minus one, you just write line. Uh, you write a line containing that item from the list box very easily. So. That's all it does. But using this program, we actually can sort the, uh, you know, everything in the states.txt file right here as is. We don't need to add any additional functionality. Uh, so before, what I showed off was when I started the file, um, it just gave me all of the state names in some wacky order like this. So, you know, that isn't ideal for our purposes, but what I can do is mess with some of the properties of this list box. I can go down to the uh, sorted property right here, which is currently false, and I can make it true. All right, now the sorted property is true, which means that when we, uh, actually load the program again, we're still adding all of the items in the same order, in that wacky order, but sorted is true, so those items are actually going to be sorted alphabetically, as you can see right here. Um, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, all that kind of stuff, right? This is all in alphabetical order because of the fact that sorted is true. And then what I can do is I can click right to file, file has been written successfully. And when I open up states.txt, uh, all of a sudden everything is sorted and it wasn't always this way. So it's a very quick and dirty way of 
doing that. Um, there are other methods. We won't get into those methods right now. But yeah, that is a way of doing it using the the fact that we have a list box right here, which has a collection, which can be of variable size, so it can handle a good amount of items, even if we don't know how many items there are. Um, yeah, it works very well. All right, and that is using input files with your programs. Um, that's actually it for our discussion on how to use files. I'm going to very briefly talk about menus uh, in the next video, but other than that, yeah, that's just files. Uh, that's exactly how you can successfully use input and output files both.